Hello and welcome to Distillations, the science, culture, and history podcast. I'm Michal Maya, a historian of science and editor of Distillations magazine here at the Chemical Heritage Foundation. And I'm Bob Kenworthy, CHF's in-house chemist. We've all read the headlines. Chinese hackers steal billions in trade secrets. But how serious are these threats? Our guest, historian Douglas O'Regan, thinks reports of stolen technology are overblown, and there's more to stealing trade secrets than just copying code. Behind every technological device, there's a whole world of knowledge that can be tricky to define or to quantify. Just because you steal the designs for an Audi doesn't mean you'll be able to put that car together without the doors falling off. Stealing industry secrets. Not as easy as you think. First, we'll go to the small town of Ingolstadt, Germany, where Audi has brought hundreds of skilled workers from Puebla, Mexico, to learn the German way of building a car. Work is a culture here in Germany. There's no space to, to failure. Then, we'll talk to Douglas O'Regan about how the U.S. has regulated intellectual property. These practices have implications for immigration, war, and the economy. It's a much sexier story to say, we stole this technology than it is to say, we copied some blueprints and then we couldn't really produce the technology for another 15 years and then it was kind of okay. All coming up on Distillations. By now you've probably heard about the Volkswagen emissions scandal and that it spread to Audi and Porsche. But we're actually going to tell you a different story about Audi and industry secrets. Reporter Suzanne Gietel went to the Audi plant in Ingolstadt. There, hundreds of workers from Pueblo, Mexico, have spent years learning the Audi way so that they can take it back to Mexico. In the middle of the medieval Bavarian city of Ingolstadt, Germany, there's a salsa bar called Bar Havana. On weekends, the sounds of Latin music spill out onto the cobblestone street. It's an unusual scene in this quiet city, home to one of Germany's biggest car manufacturers. Audi sorprende a todas las personas alrededor del mundo. That was a clip from a new Audi commercial. You've probably noticed it's in Spanish. That's because it's announcing the company's plan to open a plant in San José Chiapa in Puebla, Mexico in 2016. There's just the matter of Audi's principle. One name, one standard, everywhere. If Audi were doing things the traditional way, they'd embed their own German engineers in this new Mexican plant. Instead, They imported 800 skilled workers from Mexico to train for up to a year at Audi headquarters in this quiet city one hour from Munich. The goal? To train these so-called impets in the German way of making cars, so they can take Audi philosophy, knowledge, skills and secrets back to the new Audi Mexico plant. Businesses in Ingolstadt, like Bar Havana, have given Audi workers like Ramon a small taste of home. I am from Mexico, a little town that's name is Nayarit, and I am engineer. Ramon has been in Ingolstadt for more than a year. He works in quality control. He oversees the random tests that happen throughout the production process, like the ultrasound exams that control the robotic welding. Surprisingly, there aren't actually many workers on the floor of the plant. It's more like a room full of robots. But it takes skilled people like Ramon to make sure the machines work correctly. All inputs are paired with a body for the duration of the time at Audi headquarters. Was there someone who helped you with your work uh, when you came to Audi or how, how did it work? Yes, this was two parts. One part was the personal part, that is with this department. The personal department was very, very kind. And also the, the second part, also the practice. How will you learn? It was a, a godfather, <laughs> like the one person that make exactly your work, but here in English. This body program helps workers learn logistics, but it's also to teach them the German way. 
So what exactly is the German way, you might be wondering? This is how Ramon describes it. Because the work is a culture here in Germany. is like not like a perfectionist, but although you can do better, they push you to do better because there is no room or there is no concept or like uh, there is no time or there is no enough time to do something or there is nothing impossible. Always do because there is be here is very competitive way in this in this industry and there is no uh, way or space to to failure. And this is how Emilio, another worker, describes it. The high quality. Uh, Work and expect expectations. Uh, this uh, progressive or this, uh, this 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 planned work and the punctuality. After Emilio got his engineering degree in Mexico in 2013, he got hired by Volkswagen de Mexico. Six months later, they offered him a job at Audi headquarters in Germany. To prepare, he spent a year learning German language and German culture. Uh, in Audi, it is important because also because of the culture that uh, always you have a plan. You don't. You don't. Uh, it is not not easy to be spontaneous. Also, all need to be planned. You need to to program uh, your work. You have your your eight work hours, and you you need to to use this this time to to the uh, to to make your 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 daily work. That is something that maybe in Mexico is is not. Is not too common. Now Emilio is back in Mexico, working at the new Audi plant there. He serves as a bridge between his team in Ingolstadt and the engineers in San Jose, Chiapa. It was obvious they cannot move this complete department to Mexico to make the support. When problems arise, he's the go-to guy. I take these topics, I take these questions and I discuss it with, uh, with, with Germany. It's, it's a very important position because I am, I am the technical contact between Germany and, and here in Mexico. He's also using what he learned about the German way. Something that always you learn here in Germany is, is uh, this uh, punctuality uh, uh, skills because they like always to be in time. In Mexico, maybe you can take like uh, five or, or ten minutes uh, tolerance um, when you are in a meeting or when you when you want to make something but right now I I also learned this this skill so I like to be always in time I, I make all in time all all already planned but in addition to these new time management skills workers like Emilio are taking something else back to Mexico trade secrets They gave me a document where it was stated that I work in a in a confidential area that I'm not allowed to to share speaking or or in in paper or with email or or with USB. I don't know. It is it it was it is it's one of of the of the steps uh, you need to to fill when you enter to to this department to the technical development department because it's. It's all about concepts, about uh, new developments, about new technologies, so I am not allowed to, to share these things. And when Ramon goes back to Mexico, he will also take something unexpected. A new confidence in himself and in Mexico's ability to be a center for innovation and creativity. Not just a place that manufactures good for other countries. I think that was necessary to come here to realize that is all is possible we don't need to expect something to to take take from other countries more uh, more advanced countries and mexico i think the with this history uh, history that we have used to produce to production to manufacturing something for the united states for example but this i think that is the same that mexico you need just need to wake up to say that it's not big difference to produce something to make complete do uh, something when audi mexico opens in 2016 they will employ 3800 workers all of them will have gone through extensive technical training as well as courses in german language and culture also they can practice the german way of car production in a country that is not german at all 
For Distillations, this is Susanne Gietl. Doug, we'd like to welcome you to the show. Thanks for having me. What is technology transfer? Right, well, there's two real definitions in common usage today. One of them is when something's invented in academia and then becomes part of industry, you have a tech transfer office sometimes, that's one side. That's less what we're talking about. More of what we're talking about today has to do with when, for example, a business wants to move into a new field, a new geographic territory, they might want to set up a new office and then transfer their technology into that new territory, or they may buy a company in another country and want to equalize the technology between them. And so there's this issue of how do you transfer the technology from one context to another. And it's sometimes a lot less trivial than people imagine, because so many of these skills are actually embedded in the culture around them, either the specific culture of the factory, or just the labor market in your entire country, or uh, whether you expect people to work for certain wages, or all, all these different things contribute to the technology. And, and that then ties into the concept of know-how, doesn't it? Yes. So know-how is an idea that the common example is riding a bike. You don't learn to ride a bike by reading a textbook. Somebody shows you how to do it. You practice it yourself. And so you acquire the know-how to ride a bike. You can do it uh, even if you can't explain in words how to do it. That applies at the business level as well. If you're trying to run a bottling plant, it may be the case that things will run more efficiently if you have things oriented in this way versus that way. If you have six people on this shift and four people on the next shift, all these little things that you would need to have an actual patent in this technology, in this idea, in this innovation, still can be extremely important in business. And so this idea of know-how, even though we use it sort of generally today, actually became a very specific technical legal term in American law and in international law in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and a little bit of the 70s before, to some degree, being taken over by the idea of trade secrets, which is more of what we talk about today. For this reason, it actually became quite popular in the 60s and 70s to have joint patent know-how licenses, where the objective is, if I want to transfer you this technology, this license will say, not only do you have the patent, which is the exclusive right to produce this technology, uh, so if somebody else develops this technology independently and you have the patent, you've licensed it from me, you're still the only person who can produce this. If you were relying just on secrecy, just on having the know-how, and someone else developed it, then they're free to produce that product. But now you have licensed the patent, and you've licensed the know-how. So what will likely happen is I'll embed my engineers in your factory for some weeks or months, or you'll send yours over to my factory for some weeks or months. And so we'll transfer the technology that way, and I'll sort of take on the onus of making sure you're actually able to produce this technology effectively in, in actual marketable terms. Can you give us an example of where transferring know-how has failed? Well, there are a lot of cases where people haven't really considered this idea entirely. For example, in the First World War, when the U.S. was at war with Germany, the U.S. seized all of Germany's patents and trademarks. The other countries uh, at war did this as well. And in the U.S., they decided to license them to American chemical firms. And so all of these firms now had the German patents, and the patents all have an explanation of what's supposed to be the technology. They all say the details, what makes this innovative. And the idea is that after the patent expires, this technology will enter general circulation that way. But what the American chemical companies found was that having this patent wasn't actually enough to transfer this German technology. As they went in and tried to use it, they weren't actually able to recreate the patented technologies nearly as well as they had hoped. And so after the war, when Germany sued the Chemical Foundation, who was the American group who had these patents, they, the Chemical F Foundation was able to argue successfully in U.S. courts that the patents were not worth much of anything because they didn't accompany the know-how that would have actually allowed them to produce this effectively, cost-effectively, and in a reasonable capacity. What were some of the technologies and products that Americans were trying and failing to make? People thought Germans were ahead in a lot of industry. We still have this idea today. German engineering is the thing that they're known for. They, they have a lot of really high technology in cars or whatever else. They really thought that Germans had a lot of technology in other areas that were valuable too. So there was interest in acquiring German technology beyond just chemicals. Uh, everything from toy making, wood products, you know, really anything you could name. The post-World War II period, wasn't that a case where it wasn't so much the knowledge being brought over, it was the actual scientists, German scientists, that were brought over at the end of World War II? In practice, yes, people at the time, after the Second World War, did look for German science. America, Britain, France, 
lots and lots of countries sent in teams to try to investigate German science. And as the Cold War started advancing in the late 40s, to then try to deny any scientist possible to the Soviets. They didn't want the Soviets to gather this German knowledge, intelligence, know-how, whatever you'd want to term it. America and Britain came together and decided to organize a program to send investigators from industry, from a wide range of industries, throughout German, touring it, investigating plants, copying documents, sometimes taking prototypes. This was actually a really high priority issue, scientific and technical intelligence. For the first time, really, at, at this scale, the science and technology were at the core of intelligence efforts. And so after the war, there was this idea that we're going to take German industry as well. This will be what uh, has been called intellectual reparations. But as it turned out, people kept complaining that you couldn't capture the know-how in these reports. However well-written they were, however thorough, however much data, you weren't actually getting this, this side of things. Is there a simple legal definition of know-how? There's not a simple legal definition of know-how. It's something that has evolved over time. It was a The practice of licensing know-how was something that was really useful to businesses in the 50s and 60s. So the definitions of know-how, sometimes you'll see in these contracts, will say something like, know-how is defined at, to include all the information in the unaided memories of company's employees. I don't know how you've proven court the unaided memory of somebody's employees. I think a lot of these phrases are in there to try to capture this general thing while also providing the service. Mm -hmm. But that actually raises another point, which is that for the IRS, they care very much whether know-how that you're selling to somebody is a capital good, is it, is it intellectual property in the same way that a patent is, or is it just a service? Am I just selling you the services of my engineers in your factory? Let's talk about trade secrets. Can you give me an example of a trade secret court case? Something that ended up in court. A programmer at Goldman Sachs had programmed uh, some of the high-frequency trading algorithms that are used so frequently in, in certain Wall Street firms today. He copied some of the code he had written onto an off-site storage base, and he was, in fact, imprisoned for a year after he was being found guilty before his verdict was, before another court took away the verdict. So this is actually very high stakes. What was he actually convicted of? Was it the fact that he had uh, written down some of his code in his own private files? My understanding is it's code he created. Regardless, having the code off of the property of Goldman Sachs, whether it was an offsite storage or actually printed out, I believe he had a USB key that had this material on it as well on his person when he was arrested afterwards. Um, that was that was the violation. Those The code and the trade secrets that were sort of embodied in this code or surrounding this code were the property of Goldman Sachs. And it was considered industrial espionage to make that potentially available to someone else. Are these laws about trade secrets related to non-compete clauses? There was a famous observation lately that the sandwich chain Jimmy John's had non-compete clauses in all of its sandwich artists' uh, employment contracts, so that in theory, Jimmy John's could have sued any sandwich maker who then went on to work at Subway for violating the trade secrets or, or at least uh, violating the terms of their employment contract. That seems more punitive than anything else. That does not seem at all... Well, there, there are important issues going on here. I don't want to make too much light of this. There, are, there is a reality of industrial espionage, and there is a reality of America's technological lead being something the state has a good reason to try to preserve through a variety of mechanisms. There are people from other countries who are trying to gain America's industrial secrets for their own industrial benefit or state industry. But yes, it has given a lot more power to employers today than they had 30 years ago to try to keep their employees in-house by threatening them with trade secrets violation, with violating the non-compete clauses in their contracts. The law professor Orly Lobel has written a great book, Talent Wants to be Free, arguing that not only, not only does this limit employees' mobility options, it's actually bad for the businesses themselves. They lose out on innovation and they lose out in the long term on money when they prevent their employees from circulating through the industry. Through her quantitative uh, study of this issue, she actually found there was more innovation in firms who had employees circulating in and out than those that tried to keep their top people in-house by whatever means are necessary. 
So I want to go back in time a little bit. We've spoken about World War I and World War II. I want to spend some time in the Cold War because that also seems to be a time where you have two major economic blocks, Soviet Union, the Western world, and I don't know, but I suspect there was a lot of um, attempts at thieving of knowledge going on. Can you talk a little bit about that? So historian Christy McCrackus has written about the East German secret police, or Stasi, who tried to take Western technologies continually over decades. And her argument is that these attempts to steal technologies from abroad sort of permanently put them in the back seat. They were always trying to catch up, and so they were never in the lead. Because they weren't working on their own stuff? They were just trying to steal from elsewhere? This is again goes back to studying the, the Nazi economy, which <laughs> used an awful lot of slave labor. If you don't have slave labor, some of the production techniques the Nazis used, for example, on the V-2 missiles aren't quite as effective. So you have to find a new way of doing that that actually works for you rather than trying to copy what worked uh, when you have this sort of very different situation. But there's also a great deal of fear, of paranoia about this technology being taken that I think goes well beyond the actual sort of on-the-ground realities. There were spies. I don't want to say that there weren't spies. But this idea that the Soviet spies were going to take our technology and sort of by analogy today that Chinese spies are going to take our technology or before that the Japanese spies were going to take our technology, uh, all of this is used as a tool by American industry and industry in other countries to say that we need stronger protections about this, that we need to have more defense spending on cyber espionage protection, that we need to uh, escalate these sort of issues. And so that gets used as a rhetoric in other political battles. And so while there is a reality there, I think it gets inflated a lot. So how do these fears of countries stealing secrets from other countries, how does that connect to things like immigration reform, where businesses do want to bring in workers from overseas? Is there a fear that these workers will in turn steal stuff for other countries? It's, it's definitely a concern. And this is actually another issue that has changed within at least some of our lifetimes in that in the 1950s, there actually was a change in American immigration policy towards no longer caring as much about the race of people coming in, no longer caring quite as much about family connections of people coming in and limiting that way, but instead about bringing in as a priority, people with scientific uh, backgrounds, with technical skills. And we see these debates all the time today. Should we have more of these H-1B visas that allow technical workers to come into the United States who, as far as industry can argue, there's no one locally who can do that job? Other people argue other people locally who can do that job at the wage the industry is willing to pay and that industry uses these H-1B visas as, again, a rhetorical tool to try to lower labor costs. Could you define cyber espionage? Well, this is something that's very quickly evolving today. I think the U.S. Defense Department, who has been developing a cyber anti-cyber espionage team, or perhaps offensive cyber espionage team, would look at it as foreign hackers, perhaps sponsored by a foreign government, perhaps sponsored by foreign industry, or working alone for whatever reason, breaking into American systems and gathering data gathering blueprints, gathering access to knowledge that's being entered into, uh, of course, our more and more interconnected industrial society. To me, that sounds scarier than out and out stealing something somehow. I I don't know why, but there's a sense of, ooh, it's sneaking into systems and we don't know quite what they're taking or what they're going to do with it. There's more of a sense of menace somehow. It's a a sort of scary thing. It's it's a great plot device. And, And of course, this is an issue that it's really hard to study because no one wants to let their stockholders know that they've been broken into, their computer systems were broken into, perhaps through incompetence, perhaps because the other people were just that skilled. Uh, but either way, people like to keep this quiet. But this this sort of worry about other countries taking your technology has also backfired sometimes in American history. I'm thinking of the case of a rocket scientist in California back in, I believe, the 1960s, who was one of our, our great scientists at the time. He was a Chinese national who came to America, was, I believe, a U.S. citizen, worked for a long time producing uh, t- technology in American aerospace. But during the McCarthy era, people were so worried about having an ethnic Chinese man as one of our top scientists that they were able to drive him out of the industry, at which point he went back to China and actually did help the Chinese develop their 
aerospace technology. This paranoia can be self-fulfilling when we're so worried about keeping today, for example, a Chinese researcher who comes in and gets a PhD in American biophysics or any other field may immediately have to turn around and leave because our visa process doesn't allow him to stay and start a company in the U.S. Because we're so worried to some degree about what he might gather and take back elsewhere, we're not allowing him to stay and develop the, the same industry here. And if what you're saying is right, having such a person work in the USA, even if they go back to China later, might end up being a win-win for both countries. One of the funny results that economic historian Petra Moser has found is that when American firms seized German patents after the Second World War, in the industries where those patents were seized, American industry flourished especially. There was, there was a noticeable bump. Okay. But in fact, in those same industries, German industry disproportionately flourished. So if I'm an American firm who took this patent from Germany, now I sort of know what my colleague in Germany is working on. We may go into business together when we wouldn't have before, because I didn't know his capabilities. I didn't know what exactly he had to offer. He didn't know what I had to offer. But now we speak more of the same language. So some of this communication can have a counterintuitive effects. For Distillations, I'm Michal Meyer. And I'm Bob Kenworthy. Thanks, Thanks for, for listening. listening.